Thanks. So this is uh, the second event of the Cardinal Reeds Lecture Series. So you, some of you probably participated in the uh, food truck events. Some of you, yeah, yeah. Do you enjoy that? Pretty good. Oh, yeah. Hey, yelling it out over here. Oh, we have another person. Come on up front here. Join the audience. Um, so th uh, this lecture series is in support of our common theme for 2018-2020, uh, uh, which is cultural identity. Uh, so today, uh, we're joined by uh, local podcasters, um, Tyler C., Josh McLaughlin, McLaughlin? You did great. Okay, great. And Dr. Georgina Mitchell from the Coeur d'Alene Tribe Department of Education. So shortly, they're gonna do some intros, but um, so our common read title, Tribe, on homecoming and belonging uh, touches on uh, aspects of uh, community building, um, um, isolation, um, uh, depression, um, and I think it, this uh, aspect of community building uh, is really an important thing, uh, not only for people who are relocating to this area. I grew up in Priest Lake, was in the Bay Area for about 16 years, came back, and my first thought was like, okay, so how do I create community for myself here? And, um, you know, reaching out to colleagues and slowly and surely you kind of build up that network of people. But, you know, as a two-year school, we, we cycle through uh, students pretty quickly. So as a student, um, how, do you, how do you engage in your community and how, how do you create those connections? Because if you don't create those connections, you're more likely to disengage, right, and withdraw. Um, and that impacts a lot of things, uh, academics being one. So, um, so without further ado, I think we should probably just get started. Um, I will go ahead and let each uh, panelist introduce themselves. I'm Georgina Mitchell. I work for the Coeur d'Alene Tribe Department of Ed. I am a tribal member and I am a grant manager of the Voices to Hear grant. Uh, my name is Josh McLaughlin. I'm the host of Sustainable Culture Podcast, which is uh, really just about getting the community involved in both obvious and not so obvious ways to help uh, both sustain ourselves uh, as a culture together, uh, but also as uh, an innovation sort of collective, if you will. Uh, my name is Tyler C. Um, I am the host of about 15 different podcasts. <laughs> uh, so I have a podcast um, family called the Community Experiment Podcast Family, um, and that encompasses um, the Community Experiment Podcast, North Idaho Brown Dudes, um, a podcast called Dopio Gang, and then a podcast called The Old Man and the Sea. And they're all centered around telling stories um, and building community. Um, and that came from my inability to, I'm not good at building community. So <laughs> as one of those like face your fears things, it was like, let's do a podcast that um, introduces a idea of how to build community through learning each other's stories and respecting uh, each other's stories. So. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm going to call on uh, Laura Templeman, who's a faculty member here. So I know there's not a ton of people here, but there's two online classes that are going to receive the recording of this. Oh, cool. So there's like 41 people who are actually going to get to see this. Oh, cool. And hopefully more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you all for coming, too, by the way. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. Thank you. Um, so we'll just jump into it, because uh, I imagine we can go a little long because our Q&A probably won't be too involved. You never know. This audience here might have a lot of questions. Um, so for each of you, and, and as this panel goes along, questions, if you feel like you have something to contribute, please do. If you don't, you can just wave me on. But um, why podcasting? What motivated you to start your own podcast or um, maybe for the tribe? What what was the impetus behind starting that podcasting project? We did it to get uh, the children engaged because what we're doing is we have high school students, middle school students, and college students working with different experts in our tribe to look at environmental issues on the res and make a podcast about how the decision making goes, what the tribe has to consider, and also what the tribe is focusing on. So we just chose podcasting because it is like the newest form. And it's really easy to listen to a podcast. 
very accessible. Yeah. Yeah, it's really easy to um, kind of just talk about whatever you want, and it it's, makes it especially fun when you have someone talking with you who really gets into the subject matter at hand. And as I think as most podcasters, I think, really crave intellectual discussion, or at least discussion deeply involved in the topic that they're presenting, and it's just the perfect format for that. It's really, really fun to just kind of go on and on about something you find interesting and kind of cut it up into however, uh, whatever length you see fit. And, you know, it fits people's days depending on what they have going on. And it's just a, yeah, it's just a really fun way to create stuff. Yeah, I agree. Um, I started podcasting um, a few years ago and I, I've been listening to podcasts for, and audio books for, I mean, a decade now. Um, I think when I got out of school, I was a terrible student in like high school and um, in, the, in the schooling years. Uh, and then when I got out of school, I like magically discovered audiobooks. And I was like, wait, I can like do stuff as I learn. I can go for a hike as I learn. And um, I learned more in probably the, the, the five years after high school and traditional college than I did um, I feel like that entire time, and it was just through like hearing the spoken word, hearing conversations between people, um, and being able to take that in as I was doing something else. And a few years, I also was like raised in a family. Like my, I grew up hearing my dad listening to um, like Paul Harvey and um, Rush Limbaugh, and talk radio was a big part of my like childhood. And I didn't connect those two until I mean probably like a year ago, but. Um, I, I lived in Kansas City for like five years, and in Kansas City, it's like I lived in Midtown, and so you could walk pretty much anywhere. Um, and I would spend like my time walking to uh, the University of Kansas where I worked. It was probably like a 30 minute walk, and so I would use that time and I would listen to the Dave Ramsey podcast, and that's how I would like. I'm gonna learn about fi uh, uh, finances, and that's how I learned about finances. Was like literally, it's a th he has a three-hour show every day, and I would like walk to work, listening to like one section, getting ready, listening to like two sections, and then walk home and listen to another section. So just the ability, and like you were saying, the accessibility of podcasts um, ultimately is what got me into that. And then like hearing um, other podcasters who were like bigger names say stuff like you have an idea for a podcast make that podcast you can there's no in the year of our lord 2019 and back then it was probably like 16 or 15 there's no reason why you can't push voice memo on your phone and create a podcast that way um, and that's what really encouraged me to start actually uh, podcasting was somebody gifted me a microphone but before that i was just like i'm just going to do a podcast on my cell phone because a guy named Combat Jack who has recently uh, passed from cancer, he was a dude who, who just said like make your dreams a reality and that was one of the things. I, I love listening to this and I love having, we've had plenty of conversations about this, I love having these conversations um, and that's ultimately what like drove me into um, actually recording those conversations because they're like locked in time. Like, yeah. we're, talking beforehand, just the idea of that story being locked in time um, so that it can't be lost, you know. And I think that's a really good point in the sense of uh, if you find a, a podcast that's of interest where you hear somebody speak and you find out they do have a podcast, there's, this, you know, a trove of uh, material to go back and, yeah. and review and really do a deep dive on, so... May I ask Gerard has a question back here. I, and this is probably ignorant of me, but... Um, when you do a podcast, typically how, uh, there's three questions actually. How long is it? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, how do uh, people ac access it? Uh, yeah. I'm assuming you put it in MP3 format, is that correct? Yeah, so I would, um, I would say, raise your hand if you have a smartphone, a traditional smartphone. Raise your hand if you have a, lap, a laptop. Raise your hand if you have access to a computer in any format. So um, there's a number of ways you can access a podcast. Some people put their podcasts on their website. 
Um, other people put their podcasts in the mobile form on what's now called um, Apple Podcasts, if you have an iPhone. Um, and then there are other streaming platforms that go across, regardless of whether you have an iPhone or an Android um, format. So, for example, there's an app called Spotify that you can right. get on both. You, so you're familiar with Spotify? Yes, I am. So Spotify has podcasts as well as music. And so um, you can pretty much get that on any mobile device. Um, and then you can listen to Spotify on your laptop as well. So that's a, that's a kind of like a... I, I enjoy Spotify and, and other apps like that because you can get it. It doesn't matter if you have an iPhone or an Android um, my, and and it, then it also just depends on the actual podcaster. Some people just want to put their information on um, what is what most people will hear as um, iTunes. The actual app is now Apple Podcast, um, and then other people like to put their stuff on like Google Podcast or SoundCloud. Um, but yeah, sorry, that's a long so, way of saying. It. <laughs> so, do they typically stream them or download? You can do both. Yeah, or, yeah. Is, there, is there a charge? We'll, we'll walk you through it at the okay. end, Gerard. Yeah, I will. Come to your I, office. I, it's, it's interesting. I think, like, uh, mm -hmm. Laura, I have students that will be watching this, probably on video. And uh, I can understand people being very interested in listening to things. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I'm interested in uh, one of the things I do is a project where they do an audio lecture, which is essentially a podcast. Yeah. I'm assuming. It's typically MP3 format, is it not? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so it's just a recording, and so the idea is uh, it would be interesting to put, put it in that type of understanding and language and perhaps exploit that. So. Yeah, in that framework, for sure. If you want, I will, I'll tell you what I will do for your all students specifically. I'll just do one. I will make a video of how to listen to podcasts. And then I will send you the link. I'll send you all the link to my website and just great. post it there. That way people will know how to, if you if you don't know how to get into a podcast, that's, mm -hmm. you can just. That would be good. But then you guys have to subscribe. But then you all have to subscribe <laughs> to my YouTube channel as well. So payola. Which is another way. A lot of podcasters will also put their podcast on YouTube um, yeah. with just like a picture of their, mm -hmm. desk, or, or their um, what's that called? Thumbnail. Thumbnail. How many, how yeah. many hits do they have to do to start making money? I'm just curious. Oh, that's a whole nother Yeah, that's, that's a whole, whole, whole different conversation. Yeah. But, but we digress. Yes. Um, <laughs> I entertain it. We're, we're a group that digresses. So, um, so podcasting awareness has increased significantly over the last decade with, um, this is a, a staff from Pew Research Center, 2019. Um, Americans 12 and older have listened to at least one podcast in the last month, and that number has grown from 9% in 2018 to 32% in 2018. Did I say 2008 for the first? Okay, 9% for 2008, 32 for 2018. Um, so for the panel, whoever wants to jump in on this, feel free. In your opinion, what makes this format appealing or accessible to listeners? And we may have kind of come across this a little bit in our answers, but um, the accessibility component. But does that number um, increasing surprise you? Do you think it would be higher, lower? I mean, it's steadily getting higher, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's just everyone's got a smartphone. Most everyone has a smartphone now, and if you don't have one, you probably have access to a computer, and even if you don't have access to those two things, you know where to go get access to those things. A lot of people go to the library to do stuff like that, and so it's just a really fun way, if you're just a listener, to, I mean, you can turn it on in any capacity, and a lot of the time people will get involved in mindless work of some kind, whether it's household chores or, sure. or something like that. So kind of what Tyler was touching on earlier, is the beauty is you can, um, as a podcaster, it's very easy to make your um, content accessible on a myriad of different outlets. And um, there's even apps that, uh, for example, rather than just like Stitcher or just Google Play or something like that, it's like I have on my phone, it's just podcast app. And it just basically collects from all of those sources. Um, and it'll, so... So a lot of times when you hear podcasts say, you know, you can find us on this app or that app or wherever you find your podcast, it's really just a way of saying that, I mean, it's very easy to just kind of 
build yourself a feed. The kind of aggregator. Show up on whatever, yeah. The kind of aggregator we like. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Just Google me, you'll find it. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> really useful for podcasts and for listeners. So. And it, it presents a, um, a reality so that like, no matter where you are in life, you have the opportunity to listen. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not a, uh, I don't have kids, and so I don't know the realities of what it looks like to get your kids, like, ready for school, ready for nap, ready for all of these things. Um, but the reality of being able to, whether you're a working mom or a 22-year-old who is walking to class, like, you still have the ability to turn on that app um, and listen to that podcast. Or if you don't, you know, you're not rocking with a smartphone, you have the ability to like open your laptop while you're washing dishes or while you're painting the house and push play. Uh, that's, that's powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I think I'll skip, skip up to question four. We can kind of circle back to three. Um, so kind of uh, delving into the common read, uh, the author of our common read titled Tribe, Sebastian Younger, uh, he posits that aspects of PTSD and mental health issues that returning veterans experience is likely a function of leaving a close-knit community for a divided, closed society. Um, in another Pew uh, Research Center study from 2018, uh, findings returned a majority of Americans, being 59%, feel some attachment to their local community, but only 16% feel very attached. Uh, so identical shares of residents in urban, suburban, and rural areas feel a sense of attachment to their local community. So it was kind of consistent. Um, so how attached do you guys feel to your communities? Um, and do you think podcasting has increased or decreased that connection? I, my, my attachment to my community is growing. I, I never grew up on my reservation. I've never lived there. I would go there to visit family, but I never really knew everybody on my reservation. But now that I'm working on podcasts, I have to go around and interview people. So it's made so many different connections for me and for my students that have done it too. They've talked about how they didn't know that these different departments even existed in our tribe. That's great. Yeah. One of the really fun things I've found myself is when you get out and you talk to people, and at least on my show, it's the sustainable culture is what we talk about, and the way we try and talk about that is how we really need to hear where each other are coming from in all of these different variety of things that we talk about. It doesn't have to be specifically how we throw things away, but it could also be in relation to how we think of other cultures when we make our buying decisions, which is really the, the nitty gritty when it comes to, at least to sustainability. But it's really focused on communities when you think of it that way. And so um, when, you're, when we talk about a lot of these topics, it's really fascinating how much we enjoy talking with one another. Um, but if I can say, it's, I think what's so attractive about podcasts and people, just regular people conversing and stuff, it, and the, the growing amount of people listening to things like that is really indicative of how much we crave community. We really want to talk to each other, even though we're being told by a lot of different figures on the media or maybe political figures about what to think about each other. It's interesting how little we actually do speak to one another. Um, for example, think of how much, how well you know your neighbors in your neighborhood. Probably not that well if you're like most of us. And so, um, you know, if you watch uh, Sebastian's TED talk, he talks about how um, vets, vets are coming back and seeing how disconnected we are. That was really a, a huge focus on, on what he was talking about. And it's really, really uh, important to think about what he's talking about. And that's why I really applaud Sebastian for talking about what he is talking about. Because the need for community really just signals how much we inherently as human beings throughout the dawn of our existence have craved community we need to talk to one another we need to speak to one another because it's one another that makes us feel purpose right we, we feel purposeful when we speak to one another because we have someone who is really at the end of the day just like us so it's uh it's it's really um amazing some of these results you hear about 
what Sebastian's talking about and how um, detached people feel and things like that. To me, I mean, um, I know I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but that's really at the end of the day like what Sebastian's talking about, this idea of tribe and feeling part of a culture and a community. At the end of the day, I, I think that's really this greater purpose of podcasting. and It, it is really built within community. It's really the whole idea. And I should note that I got to, first time I met Josh was through uh, a cleanup of Tubbs Hill that he organized. Um, so yeah. he, he, he walks the walk. Yeah. <laughs> well, those, those events are, are really just exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when you have situations like garbage cleanups where a whole community comes together and does one thing for their community, it's kind of a tricky way to force people to understand how much they have in common. Like, hey, I am from one side of the political spectrum, for example, than you are, but we're both picking up trash in our city because we want our city to look nice, which means we care about each other at the end of the day. We just have to figure out what that means sometimes, but, um, but that's, that's really key. I mean, if we can figure ourselves out in a tiny, com in a small community, then the whole country can follow example of that. Yeah, scale. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's like, I was watching um, Sebastian Younger's um, interview with Joe Rogan, and he, he talks about that just like service to your community brings you together as a community regardless of um, your ideals on, on, on a specific thing. Um, and I think, you know, even just thinking about community and podcast, that's how I met Josh was through mm -hmm. a coffee podcast. Mm -hmm. Like that. I think that, and even more so, like in a small area like Coeur d'Alene, um, it's it's kind of nice because you listen to a local podcast and you have the ability to actually like meet that person who you're listening to, um, opposed to more of a larger scale national podcast or international podcast. Like I don't know that I will ever meet like Joe Rogan or one of these other like big podcasting figures, um, but it's very, it's, I mean, it's just as accessible in this small town as. Um, podcasting itself is, and you have the ability to meet or um, create community around whatever that podcast is. So like, if I have a, if I do a coffee podcast and I have Josh on, we have the opportunity to say, hey, we're gonna get together at Evans Brothers tomorrow, come hang out and drink a cup of coffee with us, we're gonna do a coffee cupping, or we're gonna do a live event where you can hear these same type of stories um, just at a, at a you know, local event center or a coffee coffee shop here in town. Uh, that's the beauty of um, doing a podcast, at least in a small area. Um, and, and I think Younger, even more so, talks about in his book what that looks like. Just community in places like the inner city, and what what that looks like in compare in um, comparison to just like not knowing the people who you live around. Um, it's it's pretty interesting, and I think it parallels what. Is happening, I would say, here uh, in, in this small community, in this rural, rural community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I for one feel to more directly answer this question of through these, through this, finding this necessity of speaking to one another. Really, I mean, I feel progressively more and more attached to my community because I, I see purpose in, in really. Um, really encouraging people to also come in the same building and speak to one another and that kind of thing. It's, it's just so crucial for so many reasons and you really start to see um, how crucial it really is the more you start to get involved and um, it's, it's just fascinating. So I think all of us feel an obligation to our communities. That's really why we're doing what we're doing. Great. Thank you. And uh, we should note that Evans Brothers uh, gives a 15% discount to NIC students and faculty. So Ooh, yeah, sure. make sure you use it the next time you're there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Plug, that's one free coffee for me. Oh. <laughs> uh, all that was really well said. And I think, um, you know, that those are often icebreaker opportunities where um, you meet somebody by chance and then it turns into. Um, a networking opportunity on different levels. So, um, have you had people who are listeners come up to you in the community and just tell you the that 
your podcast has impacted them or um, maybe feedback from, I know, uh, Georgina, that uh, your podcasts aren't live yet. I think they're going to gonna post them maybe in November, I think I heard. Um, but uh, I think you had, had alluded to that the students really uh, responded pretty positively to that. Yeah, we've played them for some of our different uh, members of, that, work for, that work for our tribe just to get their feedback on what they think. And everything I've gotten back, they've said how impactful these are going to be and how it was just nice to hear the kids talk about it and that that's what we need. So, yeah, it's been, it's, they're going to be really helpful to the younger, to the other children to listen to also, just because it's so hard, it's so hard just to, to understand what all the things that the tribe is doing. You just never even think about what they're doing for the, you know, Silver Valley mining, you know, to help clean up that, or the pike in the lake, like, there's just so many different mm -hmm. things that nobody even knows about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where, where will you uh, post that? Is that posted, like, for just the tribe, or is it? No, they'll be available. We have a website, which is oh. Voices to Hear, CDA okay. Tribe. But we will, we haven't figured out where we're going to put them. Okay. But it's going to be an ongoing thing. Cool. I can share the link with you, Gerard. Sure. I just, I was actually more interested in how um, the audience, it sounded like part of it is you want to educate the younger people of the tribe through the podcast, how they would be made aware specifically where to access those. Oh, they're going to hear them in their school. In the two okay. schools that are on the reservation, they've already asked us for them. Oh, okay. So, that's great. And there's students there anyway, so the science teachers really want to play them anyway. Oh, yeah. That's cool. I was, I was uh, in Evans Brothers one day, and this lady walked up to me and she said, I really liked your podcast on Josh's podcast. <laughs> 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 that's community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Podcast yeah. community out here like that. It was really tight. Like um, I got to come on Josh's podcast, and as you all have seen, I, I can I can go off on any number of rabbit trails, which I think I did that day. And to see what that eventually turned into after hearing our like live being in the live conversation, and then like seeing Josh like um, cut that into a really workable conversation. Um, it's interesting for then people to come up and say. That was, a, that was really cool to hear you all talk about um, sustainability and what that looks like in culture and sustainability as people. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's been, that, that's probably like the coolest experience that I've had. Like, yeah. I heard your podcast on Josh's <laughs> podcast. It was great. Oh, <laughs> no, thank you. I didn't know that, so that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I, for context, the, the first episode of, of my podcast is the episode he's talking about where we met, Tyler and I met, and the episode was titled Stories, and when you hear about that, it, I mean, you don't think about sustainability so much, but that's kind of the whole thesis to, to my project is, is um, one another's stories really is kind of where it all starts, because if we're not listening to each other, then we're not learning about each other. If we're not learning about each other, then we're not learning the value of one another's lives. Not really, um, and and not directly. And when you think about things like any episode I could do, we did one on clothing, for example. You're not able to really connect yourself with another human being through a product on H and M's shelf. Like it's it's really hard to do that. But if you can learn and just just shift the way that you think about people, and remember that everyone has a story everyone has a background and everyone has a family and everyone has dreams and all the same stuff that anyone in this room has if you're able to just shift it enough to think of it that way all of a sudden everything you look at is connected to human beings and all of a sudden we start to think oh I have to be concerned about this like this not might not be my community or or you know whatever term you want to use tribe community group of people that you feel belonging in um, but you do connect yourself to other humans, and it's it's all of a sudden sustainability is uh, about you know building one another up and learning about one another because it's so much fun to do, 
and it, it is really easy to find purpose in each other and everything like that. So when we talk about stories and learning from one another, I mean, it's, it, the gravity of it is so huge if you start to really look at it that way. It changes the way you think about everything. Well, that's one of the, so the, the one of our podcasts is called North Idaho Brown Dudes, and it's me, uh, uh, there's just a bunch of different types of brown dudes on that podcast. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting because we're, people, there's, there are a lot of, su- of assumptions that are made about that podcast with that podcast name, and there's a lot of um, offense with that podcast name. Uh, and that gives the opportunity in this day and age to be able to have that conversation. Um, but it's, it's hard to have that conversation in 2019, um, which is odd because you would think that we would, we, have, we would have grown in our communication and our ability to communicate with people who aren't um, like us. Uh, but that's a reality of, of the world we live in. It's hard to say hey, bro, I understand you're upset because you can't have a podcast called the North Idaho White Dudes Podcast. Or that would be seen as outrageously, you know what I mean? Like, that tension is an opportunity for me. Like, I, I had a conversation with a guy last night about this exact same thing. Like, um, there are things, we live in a certain context, and because of that, you have to uh, respect other people's stories and still be proud of who you are but you have to like respect other people's stories, um, and it's interesting like have like um, producing these podcasts, being able to hear people's stories and have a true understanding from their mouth about who they are, um, and then taking that same model um, just into our personal life. Not it doesn't just stay on the podcast; it goes into that, like that theme goes into um, every interaction that you have. Like, you can get upset by a word somebody says, uh, but then you can also look at the context of their entire life and their story. That may give you a moment to say, you know what, like this lady the other day on 12th Street drove up to me and accused me of something, and I think it's because I'm black, but it might also be because of a number of other things. That moment of grace where I realize that I have to explain that what happened to that lady um, comes with the understanding that everybody's story is different, and like it's that, that's hard to say though. When like it's aggressive or something like that, it's easy for me and Josh to have great conversations and for me to hear Josh's story um, because Josh is a great dude. He like I know Josh. Josh like gives me a high five, five every time I see him. You know they call him Janet Pilgrim. So, you know what I mean? Like. There's that relationship that's nice there when it's not a nice, friendly relationship. Um, it's easier to discount somebody else's story when, when they're aggressive towards you, opposed to, um, you know, a nice, friendly conversation. Yeah, and we had uh, an event in here yesterday called Columbus State Legacy, and we talked about aspects of, of just listening and hearing. Um, and I think when people challenge you, uh, your thoughts, your ideas, I think the first reaction is to be defensive, right? Um, rather than listen or hear uh, and diffuse and then have a conversation, as you were saying. So people uh, understand people's experiences and their um, viewpoints and values. Um, but because you brought it up, we'll, we'll transition into... Um, Uh, Our fifth question here, so throughout the geography of America, there are regional demographic or psychographic factors that are dominant and thus result in a monoculture mindset. Um, A book that's been pretty popular recently called uh, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for uh, White People to Talk About Race and Racism by author Robin DiAngelo. Um, She remarked in a 2019 interview with The Guardian, uh, she says, in my experience, Day in and day out, most people from dominant cultures, that's me throwing that in there, are absolutely not receptive to finding out their impact on other people. There's a refusal to know or see or to listen or hear or to validate. Um, so how does, how does your podcast uh, or project try to combat that mindset? I would say for... Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. 
Um, I would say for mine, um, because I have a podcast that um, I, I should just say, as, as being a large black man in North Idaho, um, the question that I get constantly is like, are you okay? Like, you know, I'm, I'm getting these like questions all of, all of the time anyways. And so like, even outside of podcasting, like that's a reality. Uh, but in podcasting, having a show called North Idaho Brown Dudes, um, it's not supposed to be, um, I don't know, lost for words, how you say that? It's not supposed to be like this like thing that's causing you to get emotional about race. We're just a bunch of brown dudes in a room, and it's meant to be um, a safe place for both brown dudes and brown people to talk about shared experiences but then it's also meant to be a place where people who are not brown can come and just listen. And it's kind of like uh, listening to a podcast about how to buy a house opposed to that brunt and that awkwardness of going into the loan officer's office for the first time to see if you can even buy a house. Sometimes it's easier just to hear it first before you jump into that conversation. Um, and that's for, I'll, I'll speak for North Idaho Brown dudes, that's, the, that's one of the points of it is to just present that out to the world to say like, you may not be fu um, comfortable with this conversation, but hopefully being able, um, just listening to our conversations about our lives will give you just the opportunity, opportunity to be to uh, fly on the wall um, so that you may feel a little bit more comfortable with having that conversation uh, with somebody who has a very different story than you or um, who doesn't look like you, which also speaks to like the different formats of podcasts. Uh, the North Idaho Brown Dudes is literally just a conversation that's just out there. It's just, it's, it's just we, have, we have basic topics um, and we just talk. Um, the Community Experiment Podcast is a specific interview style show where I interview different types of people and we have, we tell their specific story. Um, and that, and it's, it, it still is like that fly on the wall, but at the same time when you're, when people aren't used, I, what I've seen is that when people aren't used to um, having those conversations, if they, if, like, for a lot of my friends, I'm the first black person that they've ever had an actual relationship mm -hmm. with. Um, and I feel like North Idaho Brown Dudes has kind of been a pathway to ask some of those hard questions because they've already heard a little bit about my response to that question that they had anyway um, on the podcast. Other people have thoughts? There's this is constant insistence to learn and just to mm -hmm. take yourself out of that, this, that situation and just just learn. Just be there in the moment. Learn a little bit more. You're never done. <laughs> <laughs> With our podcast, we're given the not dominant cultures perspective because we're looking at stuff from the tribe's point of view. We also went out and interviewed some non-tribal members, not workers for the tribe either, and it it was challenging. <laughs> it was challenging trending. It, it's just the way you look at things is completely different. And our ch our kids were just just here in our side, and then we went and took a tour with the mining company, and they said completely different things. And so our kids were trying to, well, why did they say that when our expert said this? And then trying to put that in a podcast, and. We also have to be careful on what we say in our podcast. It has to be approved by the tribe because they have to have a relationship with the state, with the mining companies. So that's also why it's taken us a, long, a lot longer to do our podcast because there's a long review process just because it's a different perspective. Interesting. And um, I would say being a person who grew up in... Uh, Priest Lake was pretty remote. I think there were like 500 people there in the winter when I was growing up. I did not have many opportunities to interact with people of color, uh, different cultures or backgrounds. So, um, so I I get that when you you say you have a friend who's you know 
never had an interaction with any person who does not look like them. Um, and I think that's what's really instructive about your podcast, uh, Tyler, North Idaho Brown Dudes, is, is that it gives people an opportunity to hear and experience um, the day-to-day -day, uh, for people who uh, are going to have a different experience, right? Without the discomfort of coming up and trying to start that conversation, which a lot of people don't know how to do, right? It's an uncomfortable one, I think, for people. Um, did you find that that podcast was, uh, was it an idea that just started between you and your friends, or was it there a need um, you felt like for like an absence of that type of community in your life, or um, a little bit of both? Um, we started the podcast. That was actually the first podcast that I started, and we did like one or two episodes, um, and we were just like, it will be tight to have a podcast called North Idaho Brown Dudes because that's the thing when you move here from if like when you're a transplant and you're brown, the first thing that happens is you there's, you have a um, white friend who will say, oh, you should meet so-and-so. <laughs> you love him. Like, that's the reality of like being, a, well, I should say my reality of being a person, and my friend's reality and being a person of color who moves here, um, is you get that a lot. Um, which, to a certain degree, like that's not bad. It's just socially awkward sometimes. Um, and so then when you do meet those folks, you're like, yo, we do have these shared experiences, even if like I'm a black dude from Kentucky, my buddy's a Hawaiian and Japanese dude from who grew up here a little bit, but then also lived in Europe. Um, I have another buddy who is Puerto, you know what I mean? Like I have another buddy who's Puerto Rican and black, who's an adopted dude who grew up in the middle of Montana with no other uh, people of color really around him. I have another buddy who's Mexican, like, um, we all have, we're all people of color, but we also have very different experiences. Just like any, even if it's a dominant group, there, there's a, there's a kid who is in school right now with another kid who's going through like totally different experiences than they are. But there are some things that they have shared experiences around. Excuse me, like maybe both of them are on the basketball team and they both have a love for basketball. That's, that's one of the things that I love about podcasting is you have these, themed shows that just bring people together regardless of um, your nationality, your religion, your sex, your, 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 your gender identity. Um, if you like coffee, you're going to want to listen to Dopio Game because it's a dope podcast about coffee in this area, um, regardless of who you are. And that gives you the opportunity in that context to start to ask some of those hard questions. So it's a long way of saying it was a fun idea that turned into something that apparently people have said this 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 town needs. So great, thank you. I'm incredibly long-winded. <laughs> it's like a podcaster. <laughs> that's why I'm a podcaster. He does uh, this a lot. It, and I would say that's a fun listen because it, it has the elements of uh, I think what's really kind of changed about podcasts in the sense of. I started listening to podcasts in like 2005, and the thing I loved about them, there were no ads, it was just yeah. a conversation, it was like sitting with friends in a room, yeah. and that podcast definitely has that um, that vibe, which I really like, and it's kind of a, a culture podcast too, you guys talk about a lot of stuff. So Our last podcast was a, a buddy of mine, David, went to Thailand, and, and um, in Thailand you can get a lot of luxury clothes and items for very cheap, and so we talked about that and um, it was called Gucci Gang for those of you who know who Little Pump is. <laughs> um, awesome, thank you. Uh, let's see. I've got a question for Georgina. So, uh, indigenous people uh, have obviously experienced um, a lot of trauma. Uh, generationally, uh, genocide, displacement, forced assimilation, um, significant effects to obviously the people, lands, uh, families, languages, uh, overall culture and identity. Um, so maybe you could talk about maybe some of the focuses of these podcasts and whether you see these as um, an opportunity to help some of the students who have participated in it um, maybe heal some of that trauma? 
Yeah, so our podcasts are all about different environmental issues on the reservation. And we also have a storytelling element to it, so which we didn't do a great job of so far, is using some of our old tribal stories because into our stories which relate to that aspect of whatever podcast, whichever one environmental show they were working on, because a lot of our stories got lost just because of assimilation. And our tribe has been trying to bring that back because, you know, get the stories from our elders and record them, which we have done with a lot of them, but now we're just getting the kids to listen to them and so that they, so that they can just learn because there's so much knowledge in the in the mm-hmm. in our tribal stories that I mean there's one tribal story that talks about stuff going in the in one part of the lake and then how there was like some shoot magic somehow it would come into another area on the reservation and that was just the tribal story that's been you know thousands of years old and then 10 20 years ago they found out that there is an aquifer that brings stuff from this lake to this other one. And it was like, and nobody knew that, but the tribe is like, yeah, we did. We knew that. <laughs> but of course, it wasn't real science because it wasn't you know, shown with Western science. But so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, knowledge that has, probably has been lost just because we don't have those stories. And we, we've lost them. But that is also why we're doing this and having them listen to them. Like me, I had never listened to a tribal story until I started working on this. And there's a lot of people that that don't know, don't know any that like my tribal, my family's tribal stories are all lost because our the my mother's generation doesn't know any of them. <laughs> like they don't remember anything, so. These recordings will hopefully move, you know, help. A bridge. Yeah, help bridge that. And also, to, what we're recording now will be history for people in, you know, 20 years. They can go back and listen to what we were doing then, what we're doing now. That's great. I can't wait to listen because there's, there's so much about you all that I've, like, like you're all people that I have no clue about. I cannot wait to listen to y'all's podcast, especially with, like, um, Young people being involved in it, like it's. I apologize. That's just an opportunity, though. Like it's so tight. Mm-hmm. Gushing over here. Um, all right, I'll skip back to because uh, we have a few more minutes before Q and A. Um, so I think on the, you know, from an outsider's view, producing a podcast, you know, seems simple, easy, right? You just hit record, you hit stop. Um, maybe you do a little editing. Um, but in regards to consuming a podcast, um, I think we as listeners, it's a as a very we're a passive participant in the exchange, right? Uh, as we talked about, you can be doing a lot of different things just listening to it. Um, but what I always really respect about great podcasts are the the host has to be an active listener to facilitate, you know, an engaging conversation. Um, so maybe for our two hosts here, what are some of the uh, challenging aspects of hosting or producing a podcast in relation to that or other components? I mean, time really is, is probably your constant chance. That's your constant hurdle to overcome is time. Because at the end of the day, I mean, editing, I laughed when you said editing because <laughs> there's just so much editing uh, involved. And if, you, if you're doing like an interview type format type style, like community experiment like mine, it's, uh, it's, it's got to be polished, it's got to be shiny, and it's got to be nicely wrapped and presented. So it takes a lot of editing, and some of the silliest things you, you edit out just take so long to do. And so um, on top of that, I mean, you're doing research, uh, of your own research, so that you sound smart and informed about the person you're interviewing. And, uh, you know, it's your show at the end of the day. You're trying to spotlight who you're interviewing, but... Um, but really it's your show and it's your product, so you really gotta focus on every tiny little detail, especially how you sound. I mean, you're the host, so you're kind of like this, in the background star, like you're really trying to star your guest, but if, if 
you're not very good to listen to, it's really hard to, <laughs> to, to say that people are going to come listen to your show. So, um, yeah, you just got to be on every little detail, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then it also depends on, like, your role. Um, so for the community experiment, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the host, but I'm also the sound engineer. I'm also the, the video guy. I'm also the, you know, you have all of these little mini... Um, things that you have to continue to think about as well as being engaged in the story which is like sometimes like uh, like I want to have Georgina on my podcast but I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to get lost just listening to the story because like there's so much that I don't know about uh, like Coffee was the same way uh, when we did the very first Dopio Gang podcast it was Josh and I think uh, Cameron Motor Mm-hmm. And I remember, I, I love coffee and I've drank coffee for years and years and years and I've been, I've like wanted to learn some of these processes and I'm so engaged in their story and their telling of how they got into coffee and what that process has looked like and then like how to specifically make a certain cup of coffee that I like forget the next question that's going to come up. Mm-hmm. Like especially if you don't have like a <laughs> like list of questions, I'm just sitting there looking at Josh and and he, he like finishes what he's saying, and I'm like, oh, I'm hosting this. I gotta, like, like, I'm not just listening to a podcast right now. Like, it's, that's probably one of the yeah. biggest um, difficulties as a host is like being so engaged in the podcast and remembering that you're not listening to a podcast, mm-hmm. you're producing a podcast. Because it's right. some of these stories, like most of these stories are amazing, uh, but there are there are some that like cause you to like 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 there are certain stories that, that I, certain people that I've had on the podcast that um, I'm like like the engagement is so much more of like a passionate like a passion level um, because of like that shared interest or something like that and it gets hard to not like just sit there and just like listen 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 mm-hmm. opposed to like active listening though. you really have to learn how to switch gears yeah. in the moment with that because you have to listen really intently um, genuinely if, if you want that to come out in your show ideally you should but then you also have to tune back out and go okay now I'm the director and I have to like come out of myself for a second yeah. and, and move the conversation where it's supposed to go yeah, it's really interesting that dichotomy you have to yeah. kind of jump back and forth with. And being thinking, thinking yeah. about like where some breaks um, would go better versus others. Um, if you're recording that pod, if you're doing everything on your own, being able to think, okay, I have a low grade, a low grade Canon camera, and it only records for 15 minutes at a time or 20 minutes at a time, and after that, I realize that I have to reset it because it's not recording anymore. But that's in the middle of the most passionate part of the podcast. You might just have to like, this is a podcast. This is not yeah. a YouTube video. Think about the podcast yeah. and like, let them, and then, or like, uh, like you're in the podcast and you notice that something is going wrong and you're just like looking at the person that you're interviewing and you're like, keep going, keep going, keep going. As you like reset the camera or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still listening to you, you know, and you're like, you're doing all this stuff, but that, that that's what comes with being in the field and actually podcasting is like, Getting to the point, and there's, you know, he, uh, the gentleman talked about like the financial side of podcasting. There's a whole nother side of, yeah. you know, the equipment and like using what you have. <laughs> yeah, it is a whole other <laughs> panel discussion. Oh, yeah. or, or even, do you want to make money? Do you right. want to just put? You have a full time job and you want to put this out because the community needs it. Um, and then there's the whole like starving artist thing. I mean, it's yeah. it's that's a very long. In theory, somebody like that, in theory, who's working a full-time job and still giving us podcasts, three, four, five podcasts. uh, Don't have have children, Tyler. I don't have children. We need your podcasts. (laughs) So I do it now, so I can make it consistent. (laughs) Um, Okay, we have a minute or so more before Q&A. Any future plans for your podcasts or any new projects coming up that you'd want to share? Uh, NIC is starting a podcast. I don't know if you have, hey. if you all have started if you, if you all have heard that, but NIC will be starting a podcast, which I I encourage all of you all to listen to that one. That's gonna be really cool. Um, and I think like even just one of the cool things has been people have like come and said like, hey, how do you do a podcast? Like, 
Uh, I have a story to tell, or my business has a story to tell. Um, I've just like, I mean, like speaking about the financial thing, I've just gotten to the point where I'm like freelance podcasting um, and being able to like teach people how to podcast. Um, that's one of the things that I've jumped into here recently um, because there are a lot of people with a lot of stories and in the day and age where you can actually just record yourself on a cell phone and with the help of somebody who knows a little bit about audio engineering, make that sound like an NPR, like, like This American Life or make that sound like a, a, a huge podcast out there. Um, people have the opportunity to get their story out there um, and, and young people have the opportunity to get their stories out there or to learn other people's stories uh, through podcasting. So I've just started to jump into that a little bit. I need to like, my wife has said to stop creating podcasts because I'm what, a serial do you, podcaster. Do you need to spend time with her or something? I you know, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I love, shout out to my wife, she's the best. <laughs> If you haven't seen uh, Tyler's TED Talk, I would highly recommend it. So yes. it's, it's available. We have it linked on our homepage. I swear uh, a lot. Just and I see .edu <laughs> backslash Cardinal Rates. Um, but I wanted to open it up for questions, if folks have questions for our panel. Can you tell me about your podcast voice? Podcast voice is very Oh, that's a great important. question. The podcast voice. Does this sound like a podcast voice? You do have a you have a oh, great yeah. podcast voice. Oh, okay, great. Cardinal Reeds. Yeah, Cardinal Reeds. <laughs> no, that's that's an interesting one actually because there is definitely a podcast voice for sure. Now I don't know if it's different with like if you do like narrations and things like that because um, I haven't ventured into that realm yet, but I'm sure it's similar. I mean, you definitely have to sound much more put together than. Even it's just a shiny version of yourself in a way, it's, you know. But it kind of depends on what your show's about. I mean, I, I've I've heard podcasts where people go fully announcer, and I'm you know doing this. But it's it's different than if you're like with Tyler's um, community experiment. If you haven't listened to it, by the way, just do it. It's great. Um, but he's very <laughs> he's very himself and very engaging, and he's just the the most awake version of himself usually. And I think that's what you try and accomplish. Like you're yeah. you're there and you're loose and you're you're casual but you're serious and you're funny but it's it's all together but you have to also creatively edit that to capture all that in as well. So the voice is I is just half of it. But a lot of it's editing. And, you know. I feel like Josh just has a like speaker voice anyways. Mm -hmm. Like Josh's <laughs> voice reminds me of like an old school like I don't know, radio show, like, that the kids are going to, like, run to the radio to hear, like, <laughs> Ralphie, remember, what was that, what was that, uh, a Christmas story? It's Mr. Right. Yeah, 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 remember when Ralphie, like, went, like, ran to the, uh, radio to hear that story? I can't remember what the guy's name was called, <laughs> like, that story was called, but that's what Josh's voice reminds me, what's that? A little, yeah, a little oh, more yeah, Annie, like, yeah. the color ring and all that, yeah. yeah, I feel like that's what Josh's voice sounds like anyway so like when I like see Josh in the community I'm just like keep talking bro keep talking <laughs> <laughs> but like one of the things that Josh said was like speaking like the, the voice like it depends on the format of the show like my uh, voice mm -hmm. if I'm talking to Brian is going to be way different than my voice on North Idaho Brown dudes mm -hmm. in the same way that your voice and like the things and the way that you talk when you're hanging out with your friends may be very different than the way that you talk when you're talking to like your grandmother and her friends you know what I mean like um, I have a morning show that I do every morning called Uncle Tyler in the morning uh, and it is literally me like laying on my couch like literally laying down on my couch with my microphone like above my head and it's just it, it's, it literally is just like wake up in the morning and we're going to talk about what's in the news but but my voice at six o'clock in the morning is very different than my podcast voice when I'm mm -hmm. interviewing somebody so it, dep it definitely depends on the context of the show <laughs> awesome thanks I think did you have a question okay. you I, I know you were vacillating uh, Idaho, we have the CDA Press. I love the Inlanders, 
the review, but it's barely covering. If you think about TV news, it's barely covering this area. So there's really this huge void on actually just putting out information. But I feel like podcasts have this great potential to do that here locally. Yeah. That's I'll, definitely true. A hundred percent. I'll say the um, biggest reason why more information isn't getting put out about the area in podcasting, my opinion, is time. Uh, it, looking at the time that it goes into just to like bring somebody um, to a set location and talking to that person um, while still having full-time jobs, while still doing other things, I think that's the reality. That's like the hard reality but there is a lot of op- you are correct there's a lot of opportunity uh, like raise your hand if you go to city council meetings yeah raise your hand if, <laughs> raise your hand if you've ever heard a city council mem- member questioned on why they voted for something opposed to not voting for something yeah so like that's an opportunity for like more community engagement, like you're saying, like um, even even if it's as simple as like how many people voted last year in comparison to this year, or uh, even if it's just getting to know the candidates who are running for city council or the events that are coming up and like why that event is happening, or if it's a kid got shot, or a, you know the situation that happened Fourth of July this uh, this last Fourth of July, like unless it's covered by the news station or one of those, like, you don't really hear a lot, like, I don't know the last time we heard anything from that story. Um, that's an opportunity for somebody to jump in there and do that. But, but it, it goes back to time and um, what it takes to really produce a good show. You know, if you ask me, I think, I think that as podcasters, if we're active enough, we actually have a huge advantage for the community. The community has a big uh, potential benefit from people who podcast and really get involved into the nitty gritty on the ground like we do. And that, that is that there, I mean, it's different than if you were to listen to the news. The news is, is strictly reporting things that we sort of know some things about. But if we, um, if you look at podcasts, I mean, that's, that is as involved as it gets really, especially for interviews, you're letting that person talk. You're, um, you maybe you're uh, interviewing a whole bunch of different people about one topic. You're getting lots of different angles of that story. And you see some of that in the news, but it's much more raw and honest with podcasting. I mean, to me, that's invaluable if you are fortunate enough as a listener to have that, the amount of resources there to listen to, like if enough podcasts are actually active. Um, and so Coeur d'Alene has a lot of potential as far as that goes. Um, it's just really fun to get involved and see all that and to be able to provide the opportunity for listeners to, um, let's say for example if my podcast uh, did one on recycling, um, which we're planning on, but that's going to inevitably, if the right people hear it, it's going to spark a lot of conversations from whoever is listening to it. If I've done my job, um, and if the show does its job, it's going to leave people going, you know, we, we should have better recycling here, you know, for example. And you can't have that conversation without considering all of the why, did, why isn't it better and, you know, what could we do to make it better. And eventually you're going to start talking to the people in charge from the bottom up. Um, it's a kind of a sort of weird grassroots thing, if you will. It, it, it really, um, it, it, it's as far down in the grass as you can get. So it's, it is the roots of the community itself. So it starts with awareness, right? It does, yeah. yeah. It starts the conversation for sure. Question over here. How do you create an audience for your podcast? How do you let people know what they want to hear? The question was how do you create an audience uh, for your podcast? How do they know it's available? Yeah. I think this day and age, the, the um, quickest and one of the most effective ways is social media. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like you, you said as well, like social media is a reality, especially if you're um, video recording like uh, parts of the podcast, getting that out there on social media. Uh, an 
and a lot of it is the podcasters work like I don't do any of us have marketing teams like I don't, you know what I mean like um, if only if only I'll, tell you right I, I'll say me personally I've been um, maybe I, should, I don't know if I should say this or not but I'm going to say you guys can cut it out go for it um, I have what I refer to as black privilege in North Idaho um, I have the advantage of being probably one of the only black men who have a podcast um which, to a certain degree, like, I, I use that as a way to, like, people will say, oh, that's a podcast guy, because I'm noticeable. If you see a, a bulletin board with somebody, like, doing something outrageous, you're going to remember that in the same way, like, how many, how many large black men do you know in this city, period? Yeah, so, like, one with a podcast... It's, it's pretty easy to say, oh, I said dude, or, and even like spread the word in the grassroots roots way about that. Or like if you see um, a Facebook ad, which I don't really run Facebook ads, but if you see a Facebook ad with a large African-American, I don't know if you're like black or African-American, if you have a large black man with a jacket that says Coeur d'Alene, you're going to think to yourself, cool, or oh, or a number of things. Um, and that, that's a piece of, the for me, the marketing tactic. A big part of it is word of mouth, though. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how I personally like it, is, is word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But you can do ads and Facebook ads. You can put um, ads in the newspaper. You can you know do mailers, all the traditional forms of marketing. Um, it's pretty amazing how well word of mouth works, though. Yeah. Uh, that's what I've found. I've only done five episodes so far. I took the summer off to work and I've had lots of people actually come up to me that I didn't that I don't know and ask me, including Brian, going, when are you gonna get us started again, man? What's going on? And I did not anticipate that and I really haven't done much marketing at all. But the, the people who I have told about it, um, and the you know, you can do things like what I've done which is community events. Um, that that really helped um, like with the garbage cleanup events. Um, that helped a lot. Um, the cool thing is you can get creative with it, though. I mean, you can do social media, which is really essential. Um, which as I much as you can resist it, <laughs> yeah, it's it's essential to use social media. It's essential to use the tools that you have, um, because most people who are listening to podcasts are probably doing it on their phones mm-hmm. or their computer, and social media overtakes both of those outlets at yeah. this point. So you're already there, right? They're already there. It's probably already open on another tab, you know. <laughs> it's already there. <laughs> so, yeah, word of mouth, though, key. Oh, I uh, think we have another question over here. Dr. Begay? Um, I was thinking back to my colleague. What do you think about um, the accessibility that you guys have talked about at the beginning? Uh, you know, I'm not so sure I agree with that, in that uh, podcasting might be something more of a class based form of communication. Because I don't know which one of you said that it's so easy and accessible to get, and that's just not true in communities that I have engaged with. Um, I'm not so sure everybody has as much access as you think they do mm-hmm. to mobiles and or laptops as much as you um, uh, suggested. Mm-hmm. Particularly if you do have a mobile, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has a data service. Mm-hmm. My mobile does not work mm-hmm. when I'm back home, or when I'm back home, or even when I'm back down in, uh, uh, in summer. Mm-hmm. So from Worley to this met, I don't have any connection at all, and there's lots of people that live there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When I get the privilege of coming back to living here in town and having that. Uh, so, while I agree that I think it probably reaches lots of people, it might be more of a class-based person or a class-based community that you're reaching, mm. uh, which then goes into conversations about recycling and getting people to go and clean up Chesterfield. Well, great, absolutely. But again, we're talking about a, group of, uh, a whole community of people who have the time and ability or the wherewithal to not do two or three jobs 
uh, and then go clean up. So for like our podcast, we know that's an issue because of plumber. And we have a lot of elders that just don't, like my mom would never listen to a podcast. She wouldn't want to figure it out. <laughs> she doesn't want anything to do with that. But so what, we, what we're going to do is we're having community events where we invite people to come in and then we'll play the podcast. Hmm. And we've done that a couple times and it's worked out better than I thought because like I can't focus, I need to have me in my car with nobody else in the car listening to podcasts, but it worked out pretty, I mean, a lot of the, it worked out better than I thought it would. So that is one of the ways we're trying to do that, just because I know where we are. My, yeah, it's not, it, yeah. 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 Yeah, so it'll build on that and getting, we, I, I want to do one in our, senior housing in their area just That's to right. have to a live podcast no have them play listen to them and because i we've interviewed well i've interviewed a couple elders which we don't have any of those in the current version of the podcast but just even that sitting in there talking with uh well i did my mom but <laughs> she told me so much that I didn't know that I just never thought to ask. And when I've asked other people, when, I, when they've listened to my moms, they're like, oh, wow, I should go and ask my, you know, my grandma or whatever what they did. Just like simple things. Like I asked her where her parents worked and she's like, there were no jobs. <laughs> they didn't, you know, there was no jobs in this area. And I was just like, oh, wow, like that just never crossed my mind. And so they went home and asked their parents and then it just started a whole communication just over that. And then my mom started talking to her friends about different things and she wants me to interview two of them at a time, two of the seniors at a time. Because she's like, then they can remember stuff that the other one didn't right. <laughs> where they grew up together. So can I ask a story or uh, a question? How, how um, plumber, uh, the young people or to the, the, the folk, do y'all listen to music down there? How do y'all, how do y'all get music? Like, do you oh, okay. You can get it if you need So like when I was, oh yeah, you're going to Verizon only, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so when I was, um, when I was just getting in, I'm sorry, um, when I was just getting into podcasting, um, I was a 19 year old, and I don't even think data was really a, a thing, and so what I would have to do is I would have to go either to a library or yeah. steal Wi-Fi from Starbucks or whatever, mm -hmm. and I would download like 20 episodes yeah. because I knew I, I didn't want to go back like the next hour because especially back then, I, you know, it just depends on what podcast you were listening to. So it comes with a little like uh, innovation slash education on on the podcasters side yeah. of things, like. If, if uh, thank you for saying that because I, I would have never thought of that especially like living in this in this um, area like there is so much about um, the different cultures that have been in this area for so long that I have no clue about um, so I definitely appreciate that mm -hmm. yeah, downloading is a huge help um, I've seen some podcasters for example who have these huge libraries of content um, put their stuff in actual physical box sets that you can purchase. Um, I've seen people get creative in different ways. That's definitely a hurdle to innovate right now. Um, you know, while we have all these like data gaps and stuff like that, that's definitely a reality. And I think events are key. I think I really do. Um, if you are a podcast host and you're talking about your community, then your goal, therefore, is getting the community involved. And if, if that's really what you're doing, it's really easy to, well, I don't know about easy, but it's definitely opportune to get people in a, in a spot. And I never thought of the listening party type thing, but that's a great idea. Um, there's all kinds of ways that, that you can figure that out. I, I think there's definitely room for ideas, though, for sure. Sounds like an event for Slate Creek. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kathleen? I just have, what my, my question is, um, I think I'm wondering though how many listeners you have that are in their 50s, 70s, 80s. Mm. Not that they don't have access, not that they don't have the, the technology, but there's almost an attitudinal thing. Um, I mean, I have great friends who, I mean, they would never listen to something on their phone. Mm -hmm. They never get onto their computer to watch a movie or anything. Just because it's not that they can't, it's just, it's just 
not what they do. Mm -hmm. So then how do you reach those folks that really could be, um, how would we have a, a pretty tight connection to the community? How would we have a, a great history with the community? Yeah. But that aren't necessarily accessing podcasts because they're kind of in the main thing. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the question about how do you get your podcast uh, out there? How do people learn about your podcast? So I have uh, one of my most avid listeners is like a 98-year-old man named Gary uh, who has been in this community for a long time. He tells me stories about how he used to have coffee and breakfast at um, mm -hmm. Rustler's Roost with <laughs> Richard Butler. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like a great, just like the conversations with that, but... It, it kind of speaks to the individual. My wife doesn't listen to my podcasts <laughs> at all. Like, like she does a lot. I shouldn't say that. I apologize. Uh, she does a little bit, but she's not a, like, that's not how she learns. She can't keep up with, or she can keep up. She doesn't want to keep up with the conversation that's going on. Um, and so it's a, I don't know if it's a learning style or if it's just the way people's brain works. Uh, but some people just aren't going to do the podcasting thing. But there are um, older folks who may want to, um, just don't understand it. And that comes, like the way that we bridge that gap is through community. Um, me personally, I've met a lot of older folks through uh, my church. Um, we have a little like group that gets together every Wednesday night and my wife and I are the youngest people there easily by I don't guess the name but I'll say 20 years. It's just going to um, get you into trouble. I know, I know. I'm, yeah, I should stop talking. <laughs> um, but it, it goes back to the reality of this not just being, especially here in small town America not just being um, a podcast. It's like an opportunity to grow in community and when that word of mouth gets to that person who is in their 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, wherever that is, being able to take the time uh, to say, well, if you want to listen, I can, I, like, I've had to, like, take my friends who are in their 70s and 80s, I've had to take their phone and subscribe to, which kind of feels a little sketchy, but I've, like, subscribed to the podcast, and I walked my buddy Gary through how to, like, just push play or the accessibility, like, on a website, so all they have to do is go to communityexperiment.com and hit listen, and it goes right to the, the podcast like feed. Mm -hmm. um, you have to make it easy for people because I feel like people understand the internet, but there are like these little apps and all of these little things are just like, ah. But if they can just go to the website and just push play, that's just as easy as right. having to understand the CD when it came out or you know, mm -hmm. anything, mm -hmm. anything like that. It comes back to community. Yeah, your barriers. Well. I think uh, we have one more question. I know we're running a little long here, but go ahead, Laura. All right. So I wanted to mention that the public library has hotspots that you can take yeah. on for a minute. Uh, but my question was you skirted around the financial question a few times. Mm -hmm. To any of you, I would I always would say if I was rich, I would teach for free, and I can feel it's passion for me. Do you actually need money? So real quick, in case people couldn't hear Laura, she uh, pointed out that the public library has uh, hot spots that they check out for people in rural areas, so they have internet access. And then she also um, said that, uh, do you guys make money doing podcasts? We didn't ask it directly, but uh, we'll pose it now. As of right now, I do not make money. Uh, we have what's no. called a Patreon account on our website, communityexperiment.com, where you can go in the same way that you um, go in that you subscribe, are you, what's the word, uh, pledge to mm -hmm. like NPR, to a radio station, you can pledge to the community experiment. Um, and that's where you, you build a following that like believes in you so much that they are willing to fund what you are doing so you can um, go out and do that full time and, um, and have a more community based um, podcast or whatever your idea is. But is the answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, there's many ways to build up to that. Yeah. Um, and a big reason why we say, oh, that's a whole other, is because uh, it, almost similar to how you would talk about actually realistically making money YouTubing, mm -hmm. it's, it's a real thing. It's very legitimate to talk about, but it, it takes a heck of a lot of work and a, and a while 
um, usually at least a year <laughs> to get to that point a lot of the time. And you have to play your cards right with lots of different um, things and you really have to work hard at it. But it takes time. It takes some time. So it's a, it's a huge challenge to get to that point. But there's a lot of ways to do it. That's the goal though. <laughs> it, my, my program is a National Science Foundation grant, so no. Yeah. Perfect. Any last questions? I think we need to wrap it up. So um, what I would say before we end is uh, if you liked anything you heard today, uh, go to their pages. Um, we have those on the uh, Cardinal Reads website. If, if you can't listen, I think what we talked about earlier is just sharing their information to, uh, you know, grassroots style to help grow uh, their uh, listenership. And uh, we're really excited to hear more uh, about the Tribes uh, podcast coming out later this year. And uh, a round of applause for our uh, guests for their time today. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you to everyone who showed up today.